Bhopal, Central India, 1984. <laughs> City residents wake, choking and unable to breathe. Stampeding in panic, thousands die. Poisoned by the very air around them. An American-owned factory, supposedly rigged with safety systems, triggers the world's deadliest industrial accident. Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Bhopal, India. December 3rd, 1984. Five past midnight. And at the Union Carbide Pesticide Plant, workers detect a minor gas leak and phone it in. Suman leaves the control room to search for the leak. He heads over to the storage area where the plant's most volatile chemicals are kept buried under a thick layer of concrete. Alongside phosgene, used as a chemical weapon during World War I, is a massive volume of MIC, methyl isocyanate, the main ingredient of seven, the pesticide, the plant. Every minute, the invisible gas cloud spreads, covering an area some eight kilometers wide. Locals only know it's impossible to breathe. Tens of thousands flee their homes in a panic stampede, choking to death as they run. Unknown to the medics, MIC is reacting with the water in victims' bodies, forcing blood to pour into the tiny spaces in the lungs, making breathing impossible. From 3 o'clock onwards, we started getting a line of dead bodies. By daylight on December 3rd, the gas has dissipated across the country. But in Bhopal, some 3,000 people lie dead. And more than 300,000 are suffering the agonizing consequences of exposure to MIC. Sumande and the other plant workers survived the night. The worst affected are the old and the young, often trapped in the densest parts of the cloud close to the ground. Within hours, Bhopal hits the headlines. The death toll in the Bhopal disaster stands at over 2,500, the worst industrial accident in history. In this area, opposite the Union Carbide site, about 10,000 people live. But this morning, the entire slum is empty. It was panic. As instalações se acelerou. Por exemplo, pelas instruções para manter o isocianato em estado líquido, a temperatura nos reservatórios deveria ser de zero grau. Mas o sistema de resfriamento está desativado. A temperatura do isocianato é de 15 graus. A estocagem deveria ser mantida em atmosfera inertizada com nitrogênio à pressão de 2,4 bars. Mas a pressão é de 0,14. Dos três reservatórios, um deveria estar vazio para o líquido transvasar em caso de problema. Mas os três estão mais ou menos cheios. Sabemos... Straight towards giant underground storage tanks, full of the highly volatile pesticide ingredient MIC. Metal plates that should isolate the chemical are missing. En route to the tank, the water collects traces of iron from rust inside the aging pipes. Two hours, 15 minutes from disaster. The first drop of water seeps through a broken valve and into tank E610, containing 42 tons of liquid MIC, far more than is recommended. 
The water and iron mixture triggers a violent and unstoppable reaction within the MIC. With no refrigeration to keep it cool, its temperature rockets. One hour from disaster, the liquid MIC begins to boil. Workers smell gas and report it, but it's dismissed as a minor leak. As more and more liquid turns to gas, pressure soars in the tank. In the control room, faulty gauges show little change until suddenly readings shoot off the scale. Por volta das 9 horas, operários pouco qualificados e mal supervisionados estão limpando as tubulações de alimentação do isocianato. Mas fecharam mal as tampas de proteção. A água entra na canalização e se mistura ao isocianato. Consequência imediata, inicia-se uma reação exotérmica e um gás extremamente tóxico é produzido. Ilesh, a pressão do reservatório A foi de 0,14 para 0,69 bar. Por que está subindo assim? Não é normal. São mais de 11 horas. Vindo. Com quanto é acionada a segurança? Acho que com 2,76. Nós estamos quase nisso. Realmente, com 2,76 bars, a válvula de segurança se abre automaticamente e uma torrente fenomenal de gás, 327 quilos por minuto, inunda a torre de neutralização. Até aqui, os sistemas de segurança funcionaram bem. Agora seria preciso neutralizar esse gás mortífero injetando soda cáustica. Aperte, vai! Aperte! Estou apertando, mas não acontece nada. A pressão continua subindo. Estamos com 6 bars. Está aberta. Realmente, o sistema de segurança prevê que gases neutralizados podem ser enviados à tocha para queimar. Hoje, a situação é um pouco diferente, porque não são gases neutralizados que chegam na tocha, mas gases mortalmente ativos. E seria preciso acender a tocha. Acenda, estou mandando. Já acendi, olha, não funciona. A ignição está em pane. A pressão está em 13,79 bars. A temperatura é de 200 graus. Vou procurar uma equipe de manutenção. O que é que a gente vai fazer? Paciência, abra a válvula de descarga. Tem certeza? Fazer o quê? Quer explodir tudo? Abra, já disse. As válvulas são destinadas para a descarga de gás neutralizado. Aqui elas lançam ao ar livre torrentes de gás altamente tóxico. 35 minutes from disaster. Control room operator Suman Day witnesses the runaway reaction firsthand as the spiraling pressure blows the tank's safety valve and cracks its concrete storage bunker. High pressure MIC hurtles into the vent gas scrubber. Workers expect it to neutralize escaping gas, but it's out of action. Even if it was working, it's only designed to cope with minor leaks. Tons of superheated MIC rush straight through it. 15 minutes from disaster. The toxic gas streams past the flare tower, a backup safety system that should burn off escaping gas. It's also out of action, and lethal MIC bursts into the night sky. This is really bubbling violently now. As you can see, lots of gas being generated. And of course, at Bhopal, the whole thing was happening on a scale 100,000 times bigger. There's absolutely nothing that can be done to slow this down. Heat is being generated so fast that on an industrial scale, we cannot remove it quickly enough to stop the reaction. This is the, uh, the worst nightmare for a chemical plant operator. This is a disaster. Way for over two hours. At a molecular level, things are happening extremely fast. As the system warms up, a second reaction kicks in. 
trimerization, a reaction between three methyl isocyanate molecules that forms a stable molecule and generates more heat. As each bond is made, energy is released. Now the MIC molecules were able to react with themselves. All 42 tons of the material were free to generate heat almost simultaneously. The reaction is getting very violent at the moment. Material is starting to leave the top. Lots of gas being generated. Bubbles of liquid leaving. Right now with the, the equipment they had at Bhopal, there was absolutely nothing that could be done to save the people. So I came running out to tank E610, and even though it was underground, you could hear a terrible rumbling noise, and the concrete started to shake and crack. The tank was now in serious danger of bursting, but it held. Instead, a pressure relief valve blew, and the gas was on its deadly way. It traveled to the main plant structure, through the useless vent gas scrubber, and then out. The gas was carried away by a southeasterly wind, clear of the plant, but directly over the sleeping city of Bhopal. As Bhopal reels from the disaster, Union Carbide CEO Warren Anderson flies in from America to assess the situation. When police realize Anderson is the man ultimately responsible for the plant, they arrest him. What I'd like to do, and I hope you can help me, is tell my wife I'm alive and well and hi, Mom. But local journalists like Rajkumar Keswami think the police action is just for show. At the airport and gas, plant workers turn on emergency water cannons. They are woefully underpowered and cannot reach the venting gas. One a.m., December third, nineteen eighty-four. A lethal cloud of MIC gas. But then, from nineteen seventy-seven, the management built the solar evaporation ponds in which they used to dump the toxic effluents from different units.